Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Ron Vale, the Executive Director of Genelia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'm very happy to welcome an audience from around the world to the relaunch of the series, Life Science Across the Globe. Genelia is the host for this opening event, and we have chosen the theme of inclusion of underrepresented populations in science. In the United States, HHMI as an organization is committed to diversifying the life sciences and creating research environments in which everyone can thrive. We know that many of you share this same commitment and that together we can shape the future of science worldwide. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the COVID-19 tragedy that is unfolding in India at this moment. And I speak for all of the audience on the call today that we are with you, India, in our thoughts and the hope that you, and indeed all afflicted countries of the world, will be able to defeat this virus that has brought so much suffering to so many individuals. I particularly want to recognize the National Center for the Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India, one of our partners in life science across the globe. Personally, I've had a very long lasting connection with Indian science, thanks to a nearly year long sabbatical at NCBS many years ago. And right now NCBS is doing tremendous work in helping the community through testing and other programs. And we stand behind you NCBS in India during this very difficult time. I also would like to say a few words about life science across the globe series. This series is a partnership of eight institutes on five continents, Genelia, which serves as the main organizer, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, University of Buenos Aires in Conocet in Argentina, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, EMBL, with its headquarters in Heidelberg, the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, NCBS India, and the Center for Life Sciences in Beijing, China. Each month, one of the partnering institutes will host the event and feature an important global theme in science or science culture. And I would encourage you to look at the Life Science Across the Globe website for events planned in 2021, each occurring on the first Wednesday of every month. Now, these eight partnering institutes are sponsoring this series because of our deep belief that global communication and cooperation in science is more important than ever for the world's future. And we see this need for international cooperation in tackling disease, climate change, preservation of biodiversity, and, and much more. And we also hope that global life science across the globe will remind you that knowledge generated through the activity of science is a global public good that the process of science and the evidence-based reasoning of science is a type of universal language, and that science nurtures friendships of people throughout the world. Indeed, one of the most gratifying aspects of my own personal scientific career has been the long-lasting friendships that I made with scientists from other countries. Now for today's event, we will have one hour of talks, followed by 15 minutes of moderated panel discussion with the speakers, and then 15, about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A uh, with the audience. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kenny Gibbs, Chief of Undergraduate and Pre-Doctoral Cross-Disciplinary Training Branch at the National Institute of General, Medicine, General Medical Sciences at the NIH. And Kenny will introduce today's speakers and moderate the discussion. So I'll hand it over to you now, Kenny, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, and thank you for uh, hosting this event and having me participate in this um, great session. Just one note, um, as he mentioned, we'll do a, a Q&A at the end, and so feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of Zoom to type in your questions um, as the speakers are speaking and during the panel discussion, and we'll get to as many as we are able to. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Freeman Robowski, President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and Dr. Mike Summers, Professor and HHMI Investigator um, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in the US. I'm an alum of UMBC, and so I'm very happy to, to be able to hear them speak. And then we'll, we'll, they'll be followed by speakers from uh, South Africa and um, India. And so with that, I turn it over to Drs. Robowski and Summers. 
Thank you very much, Kenny. And Kenny is a graduate of the program we'll be talking about today, the Maha Scholars Program. Uh, Mike will do a, a major presentation. I want to give some introductory remarks. The, the most important thing I can say today is that in this country, in America anyway, the vast majority of students who begin with a major in science and engineering will leave it within the first year or two. We are not surprised to see that only about 20% of Blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in science will actually graduate with a bachelor's in science. But for, for whites, it's only about 32%. And for Asians and Asian Americans in this country, we're talking about about 41%. The TED Talk, which I developed about uh, 10 years ago, focuses on the four pillars of success in science. And it essentially talks about what we do at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, to develop this MAHA program and other programs designed to increase the number of students in science. And so one of the most important points is that we need to be changing the culture of science in our country as we think about having more students of all races to make it. The four pillars are high expectations, building community among the students. It takes researchers to produce researchers and we must have rigorous evaluation. I, I want you to look at several things. Number one, that TED talk. Number two, if you will look at the 60 minutes piece that was developed about 10 years ago on the MyHub program, it'll give you a true feel for the program as Mike will be talking about it today. Uh, and, and third, I want you to think about several of the articles we've written that we can't talk about. But if you look at, if you look on the MyHub Scholars program and you go to science, uh, you go to the journals, Issues in Science and Technology, and most recently a piece that I wrote from the Proceedings from the National Academies of Sciences, you will see more specific information that can supplement what Mike Summers will be saying today. Uh, the most important thing I can say is that when we think about increasing the number of underrepresented groups in any country, uh, the, the question of how much of a priority this issue is will come up in terms of the resources, in terms of our time, in terms of financial resources, and the idea that we need leaders of universities in addition to scholars focusing on these issues. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike with the idea that it takes researchers to produce researchers. The most, um, in, the most incredible news most recently is that one of these graduates of the MAU program is Dr. Kismikia Corbett, who is a lead investigator at NIH and with Dr. Graham actually produced this COVID vaccine with Moderna and that their technology is also in Johnson & Johnson and by Pfizer. And so the, the idea is that is if we can produce more students of color, we increase the probability that we can solve these problems as we use all of the talent from humankind. With that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Mike Summers. Thanks, Freeman. Um, one of the questions that I'm commonly asked by my um, colleagues and, and most of the faculty in the US are white males like myself are why aren't more minority students earning science PhDs? And the answers I commonly get are th that there aren't many students who are interested in math and science and the smarter ones all go to medical school. But there's so much evidence that counter those perceptions. If you look at the college board, what you'll find is that similar percentages of African-American and Caucasian freshmen who start college aspire to STEM degrees. And uh, I'll be telling you about the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. This is a strengths-based program. Um, and we typically get more than 2,500 nominations per year for this program, more than 200 completed applications from minority students, mostly from our local area in Maryland. And this is for only 45 avail available slots, typically for minority students. So based on these and lots of other data, the only thing that you can conclude in the US is that large numbers of talented minority students are in our high schools and in our colleges at the early stages and they're interested in STEM and we're doing a poor job of retaining them in STEM. And so uh, the, the reason that UMBC uh, has, is getting such uh, interest these days is because of the climate change that has occurred under the leadership of Freeman Hrabowski, our president. Uh, when we both started at UMBC in 1987, black students held sit-ins. They protested that our campus was racist. Um, but in fact, now we are the top school of origin of black MD PhDs. We have been for many years. We're probably the top school of origin of black PhDs as well, although the last NSF report said that we were number two behind a predominantly black institution, uh, Howard University. And we're, a, we're actually a majority institution, only about 15% of our students are black. 
And according to several sources, including uh, a couple of articles in science, we are considered the gold standard for climate change and for diversity in STEM. And I'd encourage you, in addition to the articles Freeman recommended, to uh, just Google Hrabowski and the UCSF medalist. They did a terrific piece on him as well. So the Meyerhoff program, it's a strengths-based program. We attract high achieving students. We provide intrusive support with very high expectations. We use a cohort learning approach. So the students work together in teams. Uh, there's, this is a really important point. These students are put in a position of high exposure so that faculty like me and white students are in their classes and even the other minority students who are working jobs and don't have all the same uh, support that these students have see them and all of our expectations go up because we see them and then of course as Freeman said there's very early immersion in research this is a photo of my lab taken just before the COVID outbreak and you can see that these these are there's a mixture of high school students undergraduate students MD PhD students all working side by side uh, and, and of course uh, several international students as well so, uh, you know, we can give you anecdotal uh, information, but I thought I'd show you some numbers since we're all scientists here. Uh, the um, outcomes, uh, we've had about 1,500 total Meyerhoff participants in the program. It's not only for minority students, it's for anybody who cares about issues of diversity and inclusion. So about 71% are minorities. Um, we've had um, uh, about, uh, 1,150 graduates, 91% of them were retained in STEM. That's a pretty amazing number if you think that these students are starting the program at, at 17 years old or so. They say they want to be a scientist and we're retaining them. We've had 930 graduates who've pursued graduate or professional degrees. And of those already, 312 PhDs have been earned by our students. 82% of those were minority students, 59 MD PhDs awarded and 256 uh, have earned master's degrees, and many of those are on their way toward a PhD. We have another 258 that are enrolled in graduate schools. Now, the program has had a huge impact on our campus. If you're a black student at UMBC, you will probably graduate in four years, just like the white students. Your GPA at graduation will probably be the same as the white students. And this is across all of our students and all of our program. It's not just for students in the Meyerhoff program. But we've had the impact on the students has also been measurable. What we do is we ask the students when they interview to the program to, to, and their parents to sign forms that allow us to track them if we make them an offer and they go elsewhere. And so we have a control group now of students who by every metric would do well in our program and we make them a, a scholarship offer, but they go to the Ivies typically. So it turns out if they go to the Ivies, they'll graduate with similar GPAs but they're actually half as likely to graduate with a STEM degree, and they're seven times less likely to complete a STEM graduate degree. And this has all been published by Ken Matten, who's done a series of analyses of the program over the past uh, almost 30 years. And there's an even broader impact across campus. Freeman mentioned uh, Kazmikia Corbett. This was taken from a television series that, that she did uh, with uh, former President Trump and leaders at the NIH. She basically is a key leader in the development of the mRNA vaccines uh, that are used for treating COVID. Uh, the US Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, was on television during the early days of COVID. Uh, he's a Meyerhoff scholar. The principal deputy assistant for health is a former Meyerhoff scholar. These are just some of the leaders in our country. But we also have many that, have four, uh, uh, that now have tenure track faculty position. This is just a collage I put together about a year ago. There, so there are more than 40 now. And they're at some pretty good places. We have four of these are now tenured or tenure track faculty at Duke. We have several at Stanford, several at Johns Hopkins University. And these are all others that, that are at Research One universities in the US. So we are placing students into roles where we hope that they will be catalysts for change, that they'll change their institutions and be inspirations for their students, just like Freeman was uh, and, and others are at UMBC. Now we wanna be able to know if this is only possible at a place like UMBC, you know, a, a suburb of Baltimore with a dynamic uh, African-American president. 
And so we did an experiment supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to see if other institutions could achieve similar results. So we partnered with UNC Chapel Hill and with Penn State. And I'd encourage you to look at this article, which shows the actual data showing that, that by partnering with those schools, they can actually achieve Meyerhoff-like or even better than Meyerhoff uh, outcomes. And so this is just a photo at the president's dinner at Penn State. Here's the president. And the, uh, these are students in their uh, Meyerhoff-like program. They call it Millennium Scholars Program. These are the students with the uh, former chancellor at UNC uh, with one of their chancellor's dinners at the end of the year. So again, there's strength in numbers. There's strength in diversity. These are, these are a very diverse group of students. There are white kids, there are Asian kids, but these are mostly minorities who are interested in STEM. So the conclusions are really that there are large numbers of minorities in the United States who are interested in STEM. And as a country, we're doing a poor job of retaining them. There are high achievers that are out there and they can succeed without the kind of support that we provide, uh, but they're far less likely to be, to be retained in STEM if, they, if they're not part of a program like ours. Institutional partnerships can be very effective tools for disseminating best practices. And, and Kenny Gibbs, I hope that this is something that the NIH might think about as well. And then finally, I think this provides a really important successful alternative to what the rest of the country typically does, which is provide diversity training courses and workshops. But there's a lot of evidence now, quantitative evidence that show that these traditional approaches don't lead to institutional, major institutional changes or, or student outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, uh, for and Dr. Dravowski for just a wonderful talk and to see the, the outcomes of the Meyerhoff program. Again, I'll remind uh, those of you who are interested, if you have questions, feel free to type them in along the way, um, and we'll get to many of them um, as we are able to later. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Mamoheti Pakeng, who is the Vice Chancellor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and she'll share some things that are happening um, in South Africa. In thinking about my input at this discussion, I posed a few questions. Inclusion of underrepresented populations in life sciences. Why does this matter to us? Why are there so few students from underrepresented populations in STEM? And what are we doing about it? Is, and is whatever we are doing a sustainable solution to the problem, or are we going to have to be doing it over and over again? I want to start with why are they so few? I mean, in thinking about why are they so few, we can look at the numbers of who apply, who comes in and who succeeds. But if you ask anyone in South Africa, they will tell you that it's because of the quality of teaching at basic education level. And, and of course, depending on who they are, they might even say it is also because of the quality of teaching and learning at university or the fact that teaching and learning at university level is not necessarily always the best and is often not as highly valued as research. But perhaps we've got to start at basic education and say, if you look at basic education, who chooses to go into STEM education and who succeeds oftentimes at poverty seems to be the differentiator. It's not always just race, but of course, in our context, poverty and race, and in many contexts, I guess, poverty and race are very much related. And there are, there are a, a variety of social cultural issues that contribute to their success or not because they have an impact of teaching and learning. And so recognizing that Part of the reason why we don't have many students going into STEM disciplines at university level, at the University of Cape Town, we've got many programs. We in fact have the school development unit. We work with schools across Cape Town, uh, schools in disadvantaged areas through our school development units. And um, uh, in those schools, we don't only focus on STEM subjects in terms of working with students, we also work with teachers, but we also get our students in psychology and in occupational therapy to work in those schools as well, to attend to the other challenges that are in the school. 
But one of the other programs that we're doing, which is specific, it doesn't focus just on, on the school we select learners, is the 100 up. And I want to talk a little bit about it because I want to get off this and raise some provocative questions that I think are important to engage with if we're going to talk about this problem of underrepresentation um, uh, of uh, minority groups in STEM subjects. So we have a 100 up program and we started the 100 up program to support learners in under-resourced communities to navigate entry into university and to thrive once they are here. Again, this program was, is an, it recognizes the fact that the problem comes from high school. So each year we select 100 grade 10, that's 10th grade learners uh, from schools around the townships and we coach them over three years to prepare them for university. We don't wait for them to complete high school because if we do that, then we lose many more who could have succeeded at high school and that's why we start at high school. Since we began the program in 2011, we, 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 we have supported over a thousand socioeconomically marginalized youth to access university education. We do not constrain them to come only to UCT. We prepare them over three years, the last three years of high school, and they can decide wherever they want to go. And we only accept them to UCT if they meet the requirements. And over the 10 years that it has been running, over 1,500 students coming through the 100 up have enrolled at university. And these are not just black students. Um, these are also students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. They go to poor high schools in the, in, in around the Western Cape. And in addition to providing these learners with a strong academic program in maths, physical science, and life sciences and English, in the project, what we do, we also run enrichment camps here at the university to expose the students to, to the university environment. Many of them have never seen a university environment and just the thought of going to university um, uh, boggles them. They don't want to come to university because they think it is not for them. So we expose them in the last three years of high school so that they get used to the idea of being at university, they see other students and, and they be, become comfortable in that environment. We build their, their skills for learning, we provide them individual career counseling and we work to increase their confidence and believe in themselves because in our view, it is not only your intellectual capacity in, 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 in the STEM subjects that will make you succeed. It's also your confidence and your belief in yourself. And of course, during COVID-19 um, and the impact that it had on many communities, particularly uh, poor communities, um, the 100 Up program includes now psychosocial support to support the well-being of the learners who are experiencing stress and anxiety. In addition to 100 Up and the school development units that we run with schools in the Western Cape, we also run education development programs for our undergraduate students in different faculties. These are offered to first year students. I will not go into that because I want to move on to provocative and important questions to think about. And these are questions that as vice chancellor, I keep thinking is, I keep wondering, are we going to continue doing this that we're doing forever? And so I asked the question, is whatever we are doing a sustainable solution to the problem? I'm looking for a sustainable solution to this problem. Does it exist? And a critical reflection on what we are doing to improve the situation or to improve the representation of marginalized groups in STEM um, suggest the programs that we do suggest that we assume that there is an under representation because the students from, from, from poor communities are underprepared. There seems to be an, an assumption that runs across there. And I'm saying students from poor communities, you can put the poor communities, whether it's underrepresented or a racial group. And my question is, is it possible that it is in fact the universities that are underprepared? Perhaps it is us. And maybe I should say, what if 
it is us, the universities, that are underprepared for working class students. Universities, in my view, we are much more capable to teach middle class students. And perhaps the idea of the university, perhaps that comes from the idea of the university and where it came from. If you check the achievement gap in universities across the world, you will see that it is either racialized or it is, it is according to socioeconomic class. And so we need to be asking the question, how can universities close this gap? And of course, I understand there are many programs that do that, but I want to push this envelope a little more. I, I believe that addressing the problem, how can universities close the gap between the rich and poor or between black and white uh, starts by addressing the idea that being working class itself is a failure or being black itself is a failure. We, we must acknowledge that teaching and learning at university is in general, in general has, has inbuilt middle-class prejudices. I've already talked about the fact that we are much we are much more fluent as university academics at teaching middle class students and not so much working class students. And even saying this, I know that many academics, not just in my university, but across, might find it a little uncomfortable, might feel offended that I'm saying this. Uh, if we were not comfortable at teaching middle class students only, we would be very uncomfortable at the achievement gap and perhaps it wouldn't be there anymore. We need to highlight the uneven playing field that, that bright disadvantaged pupils face compared to wealthier uh, students. If we do not highlight it, our students will highlight it to us through protest. And I think Michael in his talk, I mean, when Michael spoke, I thought, wow, exactly that. Um, uh, th th if we don't highlight it, uh, they highlighted, and, and, and Michael shared to us that in 1987, I think he said, the students uh, protested uh, um, uh, that uh, the, the campus is racist, and then programs were included, and that's what, led, that's what led to the improvement. And my view is that this issue, if we don't highlight it, the students will highlight it through protest, because it is at the core of the mental issues that many of our students in universities across South Africa and across the world uh, face today, irrespective of how smart they are, how hard they work, or they have worked to get admitted to the top university, they find it difficult to cope when they get there. For many of them, education is a continuous struggle and some of them cannot take it. And so they might drop out. But why are we concerned about the inclusion of underrepresented populations in STEM? My view is that we are concerned because, because education, first of all, whether it's STEM or not, education is to us a taken for granted good thing. Our, our specialty is STEM and we know the value of having more people in STEM. But I want to argue that to see education only as, 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 as a taken for granted thing. In fact, many of us who say we will take it for granted as a good thing, believe that education changes lives. That's how we encourage poor students to go into education. I do the same. I know it changed my life as a poor young person. But to think of education only as changing lives assumes three things about education. It assumes that it's neutral, perfect, and doesn't need change. It assumes that education is benign, it is innocent, it just does the positive, and it assumes that education takes place in a static world. And in South Africa, we had, a ma we had major student protests named Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall protests between 2015 and 2017. And looking at the students' demands throughout that time as an academic and a university leader made me think a lot about whether and how education changes lives. And, and I continued to think about that. And I think in 2020, I got to the conclusion that actually, I think that as much as education changes lives, 
I think lives should also change education. And, and I'm not sure if we allow, we, we allow lives to change education in the sense of the lives that we are entrusted with to educate. Do we allow those lives to change education? Through the must fall protests uh, in South Africa between 2015 and 2017, um, the, the students challenged the expectation that they should assimilate and accept the education before them as benign and good for them. They called for the complete rejection of the systemic, symbolic, and intellectual worlds, which they argued are inhospitable. They made a point that they do not feel at home in our universities and that they do not recognize themselves in what they have to learn, the buildings, the artworks, the curriculum, or the people teaching and leading them. They demanded what they call, phrased as the decolonization of higher education may sound controversial, but what they did essentially, they pushed universities and government leadership to the point where somewhat finally, we had to consider the idea that lives can change education. Many departments across universities in the country started rethinking their curriculum. Whether they started rethinking it or they started talking about curriculum change, the contestation about curriculum change started. And that, in my view, those conversations are important. And, 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 and this is not just about, um, uh, you know, rethinking curriculum, it's not just about what we teach, but also who teaches and how they teach. Because all of these questions are important to ensure success of underrepresented populations. Education is political. The idea of education changing lives evokes the question in favor of whom or for what. And I guess we can say the idea of just making sure that we get more underrepresented populations into STEM just for the sake of it, evokes the question in favor of whom or for what. And the more we silence this political dimension of education, the more we assume the moral potential to blame the victims of education or what I can refer to as the victims of education and argue that dropouts are always to blame. And of course, dropouts for the most parts are the underrepresented populations. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that there are students who drop out because they don't pull their weight but there are many reasons. That's not the only reason why students drop out. As an educator, and in my current role as vice chancellor, I often wonder whether there is a possibility that some students emerge as dropouts from our universities because they are resisting or refusing to read the world the way they are being taught. So in my view, to improve inclusion of underrepresented groups um, uh, in STEM, we've got to start critiquing the quality of teaching and learning at university level. We've got to start critiquing what we teach, how we teach and who teaches it. But we also have to ask how much of the values of underrepresented groups are embedded in what the university is what we do, the way of being, doing, and seeing at university. If we do not do that, then what we are asking is assimilation. And periodically over years, you know, we will have protests and we will have resistance and pushback from students who we are so much trying to assist to get into STEM. Thanks very much, Kenneth. Thank you for that. Uh provocative talk. I, 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 I love to we'll follow up more on that um, during the panel discussion. Um, finally, we'll have uh, Dr. Ram Ramaswamy from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Our other speaker from India was unable um, to join us due to um, challenges with the ongoing um, COVID situation there, but we turn it over uh, to Dr. Ramaswamy. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. So um, what I'd like to do today is to describe some of the efforts 
of the Indian Academies of Science and promoting science education, uh, particularly under, for underrepresented groups. Um, just as a way of personal introduction, and uh, mostly because uh, Dr. Parking has sort of made a provocative uh, speech, uh, as uh, Ken noted, um, I and uh, the other panelists, Sonajharia Mins, were both on the faculty of the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, it's a university known for its uh, uh, sort of very progressive views, very democratic views, and uh, uh, in India, at least, it occupies a very special space uh, as a, as a uh, somewhat radical university where the participation of the taught in the teaching is integral to both the curriculum and the instruction. Um, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about the efforts that the Indian Academies of Science have uh, have been doing in order to bring underrepresented groups up. And in this, uh, I, I thought that I mean just start by giving you some background as to what the Indian Academies of Science are. Uh, unlike uh, the US or uh, other, you know, other nations, India has three different science academies, uh, mostly because of historical reasons. Uh, but uh, the Indian Academy of Sciences was founded in 1934 during our colonial period. And one of the main activities was to promote uh, high quality science and to promote science done by Indian scientists, which in a colonial context, of course, is an extremely important statement. Uh, these science academies are uh, representative for the whole country and are supported by the government of India. Uh, they are autonomous, but they are nevertheless uh, funded by the government. Right. Now, um, just to make the point that, uh, you know, much of Indian science is dominated by a male elite. And the term uh, here is Savarna or upper caste. Uh, so upper caste Hindu male elite, uh, most Indian science is dominated by this particular group. In our country, social diversity is actually legislated at all levels, uh, wherever, it is, wherever you have a government supported program, uh, and most of our universities are supported by the government, we have very few private universities, uh, there is a so-called reservation policy where uh, everybody is, or all these institutions are required by law to have a, uh, an, a certain number of a certain percentage of people from other uh, social groups. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, as uh, Dr. Parking has also pointed, I mean, as everyone realizes, barriers are not easy to overcome. Poor schooling means sometimes poor preparation for entry into a university. But nevertheless, because this is mandated reservation and India is such a huge country uh, and the population is so large, uh, these numbers are satisfied at the initial stages, but the representation gets very skewed as you go along the pipeline. And the diversity reduces along the hierarchy especially when it comes to recognition and leadership, uh, the diversity is almost non-existent, is very, very minimal. Uh, all right, so uh, just, just a second, all right. Now, the underrepresentation of different groups in our country, because India is actually a very socially, and uh, socially, it's diverse in almost any metric that you might like to use. Um, religion uh, and uh, social grouping and caste and so on and so forth. Uh, but just to give you an idea, uh, the Indian Academy of Sciences today has uh, who are, has fellows who are recognized for uh, their uh, recognized for their work in the sciences. Out of a thousand, the total number of women is a hundred. Uh, so compared to about fifty percent of the population, this is grossly underrepresented. 
In this academy, there are fewer than a hundred from non-Hindu communities. So if you look at religious diversity, uh, the it's actually 20% of the population uh, that is non-Hindu, but only 10% of the academy is uh, from these other communities. So Muslim, Christian, Sikh, uh, whatever, any, any other group. And from socially marginal groups, uh, what in India are called the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, uh, these uh, you know, comprise about 25% of the population, but there are fewer than 10 from socially marginal groups. You know, these numbers are from the 2011 census as far as percentages are concerned. Uh, the data for the academy is today's data. And you know, the situation is uh, what it is. Now I want to also, you know, it's not as if we do not realize the importance of diversity. And I just want to allude to this particular book by, uh, by Mr. Kancha Ailaya, who is a sociologist uh, and an activist uh, in, in India, an academic activist. Uh, and he talks about the fact that so much of uh, indigenous science was in fact discussed and discovered by the so-called uh, uh, lower castes and backward communities. Because, uh, you know, questions such as, you know, who originated the science of making leather, the, the dealing with dead animals, uh, labor such as the cotton, uh, you know, the spinning of cotton and weaving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All this was relegated to lower caste communities and therefore, um, you know, he talks about it in this particular book. And this is a sort of, a, it, it's a, it, it highlights the importance of inclusion. So bringing disadvantaged groups into the mainstream has been one of the objectives of the academies, in addition, of course, to you know, science and recognizing science and dissemination and so on and so forth. Gender is, has been a, the first uh, objective. So since 2000 or so, there have been several women in science panels that have promoted gender parity, inclusion, and efforts have been made to, uh, you know, to talk about the issues, what are the social issues, social barriers to pursuing careers in science. Uh, like the earlier speakers have uh, mentioned, getting people into the uh, STEM areas is not, uh, is, is not difficult. Retaining them is. And uh, so what uh, we had done a few years ago was to uh, bring out a, a set of uh, stories of ordinary uh, women scientists. Uh, by ordinary, all I mean is that uh, these were just your know, working women scientists at various institutions in the country. And we tried to document what were their challenges and what were their motivations in continuing in science and what, you know, what made it possible for them to stay and what made it difficult. Uh, this book came out about 15 years ago now, or, uh, more or less. Uh, but still, uh, the, while there is a lot of recognition of the problems that women face, numbers haven't increased. And uh, in all metrics, uh, you know, uh, it has not been possible to seriously improve policies that would make inclusion a reality. And especially when it comes to leadership. So one of the, uh, one, one of the initiatives that the academies took was to have these so-called summer research fellows, fellowships, where uh, it's a summer research program for undergraduates and masters in all STEM disciplines. And uh, every year about 20,000 students apply because in, in India, uh, most colleges and most teaching institutions do not have research laboratories. Uh, you know, there's almost a, a sort of a dis distinction between teaching institutions and research institutions. So the idea was to try to expose undergraduates to research and thereby encourage them um, to stay in STEM and to go on to do research. Um, you know, as this, uh, it was pointed out earlier, it takes a researcher to make a researcher. Uh, so this is, uh, it, it's a given. 
Uh, and uh, what we do every year is to invite applications, about 20,000 students apply, and, about, uh, and undergraduate teachers as well, and about 2,000 are actually selected. And uh, there, there's just some numbers. Now, the, the point that I want to uh, make is that we offer about 2,000 uh, fellowships and actually only about 1,500 take it. So there is a, there is a gap, there's about 500, uh, 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 500 fellowships are wasted. And when we analyzed this uh, over a 20 year period, we found that over a, you know, one and a half hundred thousand applications that were received, the applications from the country are very, very uneven. Uh, what this map tries to show is that there are some states, the green ones, where there's a lot of science activity and there are the orange ones and orange and yellow where there is relatively uh, less, uh, you know, fewer applications, representative of the fact that there are fewer uh, institutions and fewer people going into science. Now, uh, this part of India, the Northeast, which is largely uh, orange and darker orange, uh, is largely populated by uh, scheduled tribes, as are the states of Bihar, Jharkhand, and Chhattisgarh or Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal, and so on. So uh, the, there's a sort of a very direct correlation between populations of these mar socially marginal groups and a lower amount of application for the summer research. And uh, so these have been, uh, you know, so looking at a map like this, uh, we had an idea of uh, trying to, uh, you know, target these areas by through a special program that would be focused uh, regionally on 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 precisely uh, these uh, on these areas as far as women is concerned uh, over the years the proportion has increased and today actually more women apply for research than men do so the gender parity is actually being achieved over this 20 year period without much difficulty. Uh, on other fronts, the parity has not been, uh, has, has not been achieved. And uh, what we tried to do was uh, to address the gap between the number of fellowships offered and the number taken uh, this gap, we thought that we could apply this to uh, different, you know, give it to students working in these areas. So this is a program where uh, students and teachers working in northeastern states, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jammu and Kashmir, Jharkhand, etc., were there was exclusively a program for them, and uh, it's had some success. It's no, it's not been great. Uh, because, uh, you know, without asking for uh, either a societal a social uh, affiliation or the religion, what we decided to do was to follow a policy of looking at these regions as regions of target rather than uh, particular social groups. I'll come to uh, that momentarily also. Uh, and so these are regions of deprivation and all students who study in that region experience their deprivation. So, uh, you know, so the, we had hoped that we'd have a slightly better acceptance ratio, but still, this is a targeted intervention uh, in this region. Okay. A little more successful has been this collaboration that uh, the Academy had with the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore where we had a special one month long summer school for students from all over India, but belonging to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities. Uh, we started this program in 2019, uh, offered, offered 90 fellowships uh, of which 85 were availed. So this was actually quite successful. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has put it on hold in 2020 and this year and presumably next year as well. But this is very specifically targeting just particular social groups and uh, this seems to work. Hopefully this will pay off in terms of having more students in the, uh, 
pursue science, particularly go on to careers in research. To summarize uh, on these particular aspects of, uh, you know, of targeted intervention, uh, one of the reasons, I mean, as, as I've tried to highlight over here, uh, there has been a serious attempt by the science for, to make science and higher education more accessible to more diverse communities in our population. This does not happen easily without special schemes to promote inclusion. Uh, either through legislation such as the reservation policy of the government of India or through the more informal grassroots level schemes such as I have described over here. Uh, a point that was made by Dr. I mean, this point that's made by all of us is that increased diversity is valuable not only because it is more representative of the society that is funding this research, but also because there is value in the input of different experiences and it's sort of increasingly appreciated that a very diverse set of inputs correlates directly with the innovativeness of the science that is done. And the final point, and we should do this because this is just. The, just, the justice that I allude to is, uh, is that epistemic justice is inclusion is a just thing to do. The philosopher Miranda Fricker has identified a very distinctive kind of epistemic uh, injustice, namely the wrong done to someone as the, in their capacity as a knower or a purveyor of knowledge. There are two such wrongs, testimonial and hermeneutical. So testimonial injustice is something that we all face uh, so frequently is the prejudice that, is, that causes a hearer to unfairly assign a lower level of credibility to a speaker because of their identity, who they are. So, you know, due to bias against people, racism or gender, um, whatever, the testimony of the, of the speaker is called into question just for their identity. The hermeneutical injustice occurs when the, there's a gap in the interpretative resources uh, that are available to the community, and this puts the speaker at a disadvantage. This occurs when you cannot even understand what it is that people are talking about because your world does not include them. Uh, I think in some sense what Dr. Faking was talking about is that, you know, the, the feedback from the learner to the process is so important. Now, these injustices are commonly experienced by, experienced by people from marginal groups and minority communities because there is no framework within which they can express their opinions and to be taken seriously. So I think it's important for us to have diversity for this very important philosophical reason as well. And with that, let me thank you for your attention over here. But before I conclude com uh, completely, I would like to very briefly tell you about my co-presenter or Professor Sonajharia Mins, who should have been here. She is the vice chancellor of the SKM University in a place called Dumka in the state of Jharkhand. Uh, she's an Indian academician and, and an activist uh, who belongs to one of the, the scheduled tribes of India, the Orang tribe. And she is the second person from her community to be appointed as a vice chancellor in the uh, Sido Kanhu Murmu uh, University in Dumka. And Dumka is in one of the orange states over here. I've just pointed it out on that map that I used. Okay. Um, Professor Mintz completed her schooling in uh, one of the cities in this state. She did her undergraduate studies at the Women uh, Christian College in Chennai and studied mathematics at the Christian College in Chennai also. She then moved to the Jawaharlal Nehru University where she did her MPhil and PhD and uh, then got a job as an academic in two state universities in India and came back to JNU where she has worked for the rights of underprivileged students. Uh, she was also the president of the Teachers Association. She's been very important, involved in the quest for a certain kind of truth, fairness, and transparency in administration. Uh, and this, was, this characterized her work 
uh, as the president of the Teachers Association. Uh, and recently, after she became vice chancellor, she says uh, that uh, what she learned at JNU is that society cannot tolerate that somebody from a marginalized community is equal to those who are from privileged backgrounds. And this happens blatantly. Uh, she was the equality officer at JNU and worked as a, in the proctorial office. And she found revelation after revelation on caste-based discrimination. But there's also a certain humanity to her because she realized that students who discriminate don't realize it and they need to be corrected rather than punished. Uh, in a recent picture that went viral, here is an image of uh, the directors of, of several technical universities and institutes of science. Uh, there are about 30 people in this group and they have taken a photograph to the president of India there's not a single woman. And the importance of this came to light last year when Vice Chancellor Mins helped back to bring women workers from the state of Jharkhand who were stranded in Tirupur in Tamil Nadu, which is a distance of about 2000 kilometers. She sent a bus to go and bring them because she knew the importance of the work that they do and they knew that it was necessary to bring them back during this pandemic. Uh, this, like nothing else, underscores the importance of having diversity in academic leadership. The empathy and humane approach displayed by her was exceptional and certainly, in my experience, unique. And with that, let me really thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, this has been you know, a really wonderful panel. Um, I've learned a lot about different contexts and we heard a lot of similarities. Um, I want to, uh, we'll have time for questions now and I'll start with a couple of questions that you all can, you know, maybe respond to. One of the themes that kind of resonated through all your talks was the issues of um, both structural roles that structural issues that impair our ability to move forward and then the idea of sustainability and so i would like you know each of you to talk what are some of the structures that you think about that um are really impairing our, our ability to move forward and those could be at the university level appointment promotion tenure criteria from funders legally politically socially what are some of the structures that are keeping us from moving forward? And then how do we, you know, what, what would your dream be of actually knocking that down and making something that's that's more just, as you say? Maybe I'll start with you, Ram. Um, what are some of the structures that you see? And then we can, we can uh, work our way back around the panel. You see, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, condition in India is different because most jobs are really, uh, they, they are indirectly paid by the government of India. So here the reservation policy is an extremely important one. But many times, uh, you know, having this diversity at the uh, faculty level, let's say, gets to be very difficult because you just don't have enough people coming in uh, in the stream. If you don't have a, uh, a scheduled try, you know, if you, you can't make an appointment of a person of, um, you know, from the one of the, let's say a scheduled tribe or a scheduled caste, they aren't, if there aren't enough people with that qualification. So really the intention has to be at lower and lower levels so that we feed into the pipeline. So this has been one of the biggest uh, drawbacks that we have had in, you know, many institutions. Uh, we have this legislated reservation. You must have a, a professor of, let's say, mathematics, uh, who is from one of these, uh, from, uh, let's say, the scheduled tribe community, and there just aren't enough candidates. Uh, you know, so, you know, so I think that interventions have to be, the earlier the interventions, the better. And that's, that's the one way in which we will make, uh, make this whole process sustainable. Because, like you, you know, like it was mentioned by uh, Professor Herbowski uh, about the uh, you know uh, 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 students of color wanting to uh, go into STEM. Here we have students of you know every different social group wanting to go into STEM. 
uh, there is a deep realization in our society that STEM liberates. Uh, if not directly STEM, definitely E liberates, um, you know, the information technology and engineering. That's, that's very much a, a, some, you know, an aspirational goal for students from all backgrounds. So, um, you know, so I, th I think that the interventions that I would like to really see are at the earlier level, which is why I talked about the, uh, uh, the summer programs. Great, thank you. Um... Mamo, do you want to think about some of the maybe structural issues and we'll come back to our, our U.S. colleagues? Kenneth, I, I think the big issues that universities are generally change others. Mm -hmm. The establishment in universities is very strong. Mm -hmm. any, any voice of change um, is viewed with suspicion, especially if it is a voice um, from someone who comes from underrepresented groups because it is seen as bringing the university down. This narrative is very common, even when you get a black African being appointed to a leadership position, there's a perception that the standards will go down simply because of your race, simply because of your socioeconomic class or where you grew up or where you went to school. And that just tells you, so before you say anything, just the way you look, your identity already makes people have this idea that we're going down. And, and I can, I'm a good example of that. It doesn't matter that your CV, academic CV is the same as everyone. And it doesn't happen in South Africa only. It happens in many places because we live in a world of patriarchy and racism. We should never forget that. So if we, we, we want change, we want allies um, uh, from, from around the spectrum. And that's the power, I think, of diversity. The second thing is that the, 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 what, what, what impedes us from moving forward or from changing is the idea that science is neutral. You know, even when the students challenge us, the challenge to decolonize the curriculum comes across, um, everyone says, well, the humanities must do this. Science is neutral and there's nothing we can do. But of course, decolonizing is not just about what we teach. It's also who teaches and how we teach it and the values, the ways of being and seeing in the context of teaching. And I think that that gets forgotten. And, but of course that also happens because of the hegemony of Western knowledge, all right? The, 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 there's this, the dominance of Western knowledge brings that about. And, and the idea that if we change, we will not be globally competitive. There's this idea, we, and, and, and you know, if you're in a developing country, there's, a, there's a, 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 a fear that, oh, we will fall from grace, if you, if you like. So, 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 so I think to change, we need, we need more people. But firstly, we need, we need to deal with racism and patriarchy for people to understand that actually a voice from a different a person who's different is not necessarily inferior, unknowledgeable, or not caring for the future of the institution. It cares for the future of the institution. And especially if the academic CV is strong, then you can be sure that even if it sounds different, they will foreground to make sure that the academic standards are kept. But the idea of having to think differently about what we do, so, so, so I think there's a much bigger thing about, I mean, I have argued that universities um, have been complicit in the, in the uh, uh, racism and discrimination that we see in the world. We actually reproduce it. We produce inequality, we reproduce inequality. We, 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 we affirm it, we, we, we do a lot of things because we don't, we are above critique in many ways. Universities can critique teaching at basic education but it's not so much teaching at university. Nobody questions us about why our pass rates are low. It's almost like if the, 
uh, success rates are low at university, then you're good. Uh, but at high school, we, 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 we chastise high school teachers. They are not doing their jobs if the students don't succeed, but not at university. At university, if the students succeed, it seems, you know, so, so there's something about the university. And I think this holier than thou attitude of universities makes contribute to, the, to being change of ass. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Roboski, Dr. Summers. Sure. Let, let me talk about some of the things that go across our cultures. As I listened to Dr. Parking and to Dr. Ramasani, so I mean, several things come up. Um, first of all, broadly, to answer your question about structures, there are societal issues that relate to what Dr. Parking said about structural racism. Uh, it, it's about racism, but it's also about sexism, the way we think about it. As she talked, I couldn't help but think as president now, of, but almost 30 years at UMBC of how I was viewed as the first African American and the way people thought necessarily standards would come down. We have biases that we don't even realize in our society, whether it's about social groups, Dr. Ramasamy, or it's about gender, uh, and that's in all of our cultures. There's several things I would say. The, the fundamental question is how are we going to move the needle? How will we increase the number of women, of people of color, of people from certain social groups who become a part of the scientific enterprise. Well, they're talking about the professoriate, or eventually going into the National Academies of Sciences and any of our countries, uh, but the pipeline, how do we increase it? And there's several things I would say. Clearly, we've got to look at universities. I'm going to recommend that you read one of the articles I wrote recently in, for The Atlantic on how higher education must address the issue of structural racism. And it says what Dr. Parking says. It's not just about racism outside of our universities. It's what happens structurally in our institutions that continue to increase the numbers of certain groups who are succeeding and others who are not. But there's two or three other points. I, I want us to think about the issue of gender and what we've done in this country. We still problem with the underrepresentation of women, in, particularly in certain disciplines in science. It's better in some disciplines, not as good in others. But the, the National Science Foundation's uh, advanced program has made substantial progress in increasing the number of women who actually become tenured and move into leadership positions. I served as the PI on our grant at NSF for, NS, for, the, for that program. And I would recommend it to people to look at what a national agency can do to give incentives to universities to increase the number. The, 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 the point we made in the National Academy study on Blacks and Latinos is we need that same kind of program for, for Blacks and Latin, Latinx, for, for race that we have for gender if we are to increase the professoriate. Because just as we talk about Maha for students, the fact is that in America, very few professors in our science and engineering departments are Black or Latinx, extraordinarily small percentages. And then finally, the point I would make is that we need to look at best practices like Milehoff and other programs that have increased these numbers and see how we can take a laser focus to replicating those programs. One final statistic, we found that in looking at the top 30 universities in our country in producing black bachelors who go on to get PhDs and producing Latino bachelors who go on to get PhDs, if we doubled the number of students who were successful in those institutions, we would literally increase by 30% the number of black PhDs in America per year and by 45% the percentage of Latinos getting PhDs in our country. So best practices, replicating those efforts and looking at national policies that can give incentives to universities to change. I, I think that I would add to what you all have, have just said that focus more on the universities and look at the, the funding system in our country. So Kenny Gibbs has published an article showing that in the US, we are producing more and more black PhDs, not nearly enough, but compared to where we were 10 years ago, the numbers have gone up. So why aren't those individuals either getting into academic positions or being successful in academic positions? And one terrible statistic is that if you are a black scientist in the US in an academic institution, your chances of getting your NIH grant funded are lower than your white counterparts. And so people are trying to understand what is it about that institutional system that makes it harder for those Blacks that do finally make it into academics to have a successful career. And one of my former students just talked to me about the fact that, and she's at a very prestigious university in the Northeast, 
She's been there for some time now. She hasn't been able to get her grant funded because um, the fact that she wants to focus on breast cancer in Black women and the disparities among, um, among Black women versus white and other women in the US. And so despite the fact that her grant is getting a good score, it's not quite good enough to be funded. And this is a common problem. There's an article that was published that said the reason Blacks aren't getting funding is because they choose uninteresting research topics. So the question is, what makes it interesting? It's the study sections that review those grants. And if those study sections are white guys that look like me, they may not have the same interest as the, uh, the people who are submitting the grants. A, a major factor is that some of those institutes that provide funding, their pay lines are between nine and 10 and 11 percentile. What that means is that if 100 grants go in, only nine will be funded. And so if you're a junior faculty member and you're competing with people who are submitting renewal applications, it makes it very hard to compete whatever your race is in some areas of science. And I think that many minorities in the US are trying to make it focusing on areas where the NIH is not putting significant resources to study those important questions that are really of interest to minority communities. Uh, and I would say of interest to the American community, right? Because they are, <laughs> we are American, we are citizens, we are human, which I agree with. Two points that I will make before we move on to another uh, quick question is, um, we're talking about structural issues. I just wanted to bring the note of those who are not familiar, the National Institute of Health, where I work, has a new initiative called Unite, and it's actually aimed at addressing, it, it acknowledges structural racism, including in the biomedical research enterprise of which we are part of the system, and is aiming to tackle both these issues in extramural funding within the internal NIH workforce, because the internal NIH workforce largely will mirror the academic workforce as it relates to the lack of leadership, um, as well as thinking about specifically issues of health disparities and health inequities and to enhance funding streams there. So I just want to make that known. And that's one example of how our agency is moving forward to tackle these issues. Um, again, so that is NIH Unite. And the only other point I would make is that a program that we've started at NIGMS, which has become a trans-NIH program, is called Mosaic. And what that does that builds off that paper that Dr. Summers just referenced is that it really focuses on people who have their PhDs who are primed to become faculty and creates a bridge way for them. Because oftentimes, and many of these um, programs that you mentioned focus early. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm an alumnus of the Meyerhoff program. So starting early is great. But what I saw after I left was that me and my friends were at elite institutions publishing first author papers in single word journals and having terrible experiences such that particularly three of my black women friends said I'm leaving science altogether. And one said, you know, I might stay in science, but I'll never do academia. And so what we thought about is how do we not have people who are brilliant contributors go through all this and how do we make sure that they can have a good experience and that we can then benefit from that experience. So if you're in the United States and if you're looking for a model, I would commend you to the NIH Mosaic, which is Maximizing Opportunities for Scientific and Academic Independent Careers Program. We're really recruiting a much more diverse pool of postdoctoral scholars who are poised for academic positions and providing the support to transition through. Um, because I know that early interventions is important, but I, I say, you know, as a man, men are overrepresented both in faculty and leadership positions, right? And so we have not been limited by the number of men that are produced, by the number of men that, is, that ascend to leadership. And so I always want us to think about what we can do with who we have as we in, move, aim to move the needle. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to audience questions. Um, and let's see, this is for um, Dr. Paking from um, Jean-Claude Twizeri. Um, it says, there are more scientists like myself from the African continent running research labs in the US, Canada, and Europe than in Africa. We need to return home and rebuild STEM in our home countries, just like Indian and Chinese scientists are successfully doing. Um, maybe you can give some thoughts on, on um, people, you know, you know, African scientists outside of Africa coming back, some, some thoughts on that, <laughs> that comment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kenneth. I mean, of course, the world is talking about the brain drain from, from Africa, and we can go on and on about that, and it almost feels like the African go back home. Uh, but some people might not be able to go back home, come back home to Africa, or want to, and I think it's their free choice. 
and they may be making a valuable contribution not only to the country where they are but but to the world of science and i i have i have uh, suggested that perhaps we should consider the countries that benefit from uh, scientists who come from developing countries um, uh, to pay some tax and this can be regulated in uh, by some international body um, and and so 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 the way to contribute doesn't have to be people going back it doesn't only have to be uh, people going back home but it can be in a way that their contribution where they are in science where they are uh, and some revenue for the count their country of origin i think if we do that then it stops being uh, some kind of a blame game go home uh, if you don't go home then please shut up uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the way it should work. I think we should treat people with dignity. People should have a choice where mm -hmm. they want to live, contribute, and and find a way of making the world function in a in a in a in a productive way. And, and as you know, Africa will have the the largest young population in the world soon, right? So so it's a matter of time before we we have the population that's ready to be scientists. Uh, so what's the world gonna do? Come and steal them and come and stay with you? Come on, I mean, we can have a system that's uh, mutually beneficial. Great, thank you. I'm gonna direct this question to Dr. Robowski it's from Jack Canwall, and I think we can think more broadly. The question uh, type was how important is it for institutions to have minorities in multiple leadership positions and um, recruitment and attention at every level. But I think more broadly, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, you know, leadership, advancement, you know, some thoughts on that 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 pathway, because it seems as though we are even slowly making progress at earlier stages. We are not making the stages, as, as Dr. Raswami mentioned, in India and, and others have mentioned. So talk about leadership. And then when, as you think about that, that, con that concept of sustainability, right? The idea does, does this all end when you retire, Dr. Robowski, or like, how do we make sure that it doesn't just end when the charismatic leader um, moves on? Sure, the, 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 our most recent book is entitled, entitled The Empowered University. And the first sentence in the book is, it's not about me, it's about us. That when we talk about leadership, it cannot be about the charismatic Dr. Park King or Dr. Ramasam or Dr. Summers. It has to be about a lot of people who take ownership of these issues. And I would suggest two or three things. Number one, we do need more people of color and women in leadership positions. Uh, I am especially interested in diversifying the professoriate. I think that we start there, that people who can have the greatest impact will be those who have some background, for example, in STEM themselves uh, and who can speak to the issues. But secondly, uh, we need people who can serve as allies. We need not only people of color, for example, or women, we need whites. We need, this is why I'm always delighted for Dr. Summers to be the lead. I, actually, in our last book on, on producing scientists, we have Dr. Summers on the cover, and people wanted to know, why would you have a white male on the cover talking about increasing more blacks you know, and women? I said, because we've got on there, we've got Dr. Summers, we've got a young black male, we've got a young Korean American woman on there. And the point is that the power in science in any of our countries is heavily in the hands of men and often white men. They just are in India, Indian men. And the question is, who are those Dr. Ramasar Samis of the world who are saying, but we want to embrace these issues ourselves. So leadership should include, yeah, more people of color and more women, but also men, particularly men in, in the majority populations who understand that the future of science depends on bringing everybody into it. Final point, um, when we think about trust in science around the world, given the political dynamics in our country and others, it's only by having more people who look like the populations that those populations will truly trust that the science is for them. Dr. Kismikia Corbett is a perfect example. Young blacks are seeing her as first black woman in the world to create a vaccine. And they're saying, my goodness, maybe I can do this. Little girls are saying that. So we need that for diversity, for leadership. We've got to have people from these populations at all levels. Ram, can you talk a little bit about the, the leadership um, the leadership issue? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, unfortunately, you know, um, Sona is not here with us, but uh, she sort of typifies why it is so important to have, uh, you know, representation from different social groups. I mean, she's a woman and a tribal, uh, you know, and this means actually something more uh, over here. It's, uh, you know, the kind of, of uh, barriers that she has had to cross are phenomenal. 
she has made such a uh, and and she is one of two women who are uh, from her community who have become vice chancellors now, the main thing that she brings is understanding of you know i mean she understands what it is uh, you know there's that honesty of experience which is there and there is empathy like that does not Um, by she is, she knows the difficulties that her students are facing, and the change that she will bring to her uh, university uh, is really grounded in that kind of experience. So, the importance. I mean, you know, like uh, Freeman has pointed out, uh, there are very few uh, black presidents uh, in the United States. So just as a percentage, they, you know, uh, you know, not looking at the size of the universities and so on. Likewise, in India, people from these marginalized communities, the percentage is absolutely abysmal. And what we lose in the process is that kind of empathy. Uh, thanks. And, and also very okay. importantly, the fact that, you know, I, you know, yes, we can, you know, the yes, we can feeling that, uh, that a community has when you see one of your own uh, doing it, whether it is you know, winning a medal at the Olympics or becoming a vice chancellor of the university. It's that same feeling that this too is possible for me. Yeah. When I was, as I said, as I said, and this is one of the jokes I tell, but it's true. When I was a graduate student, there were more black presidents in the United States because Barack Obama yeah. was president. Then there were black tenured faculty members at the university I went to. And I'm not picking on my university because every, every elite institution that I interviewed at had the same thing going on and many of the intramural Absolutely. institutes at NIH do. So I was like, it shouldn't be easier to get to the White House than the tenure track. And if so, then we need to think about what we're actually saying about who we are. Okay, um, Mike and Mamo, do you all have any, any comments as you think as, on this concept of leadership? Or, or if not, we can go to another question. <clears throat> Anything? Mama. Mama. We can get another question. Okay. Um, I'm a funder. We've talked about funders. Uh, what, what are some roles you think? And, 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 and Ram, I, I don't think I was as clear as the role that the Indian government plays in many jobs, but maybe can we speak a, more about that model and how you think funders, either domestically, internationally, what roles they can play to promote this structural change? Is it at the institution level? Is it trying to find the talented folks, quote unquote, and throw a lot of resources at them and hope that they move forward. Um, what do you think about how, you know, funders can play a role in, in catalyzing change? Also recognizing that particularly government funding is responsive to political pressure. But um, uh, Ram, why don't, you, why don't you start? Okay, uh, well, very briefly, let me say that the Indian government has started something in the area of gender, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, they've Try to follow the Athena Swan uh, model that, mm -hmm. uh, that the UK uses. That um, you know, having a certain kind of diversity entitles you to a little better uh, prospect of funding. So I think that rewarding institutions for enhancing their diversity could be a way, could be a very legitimate and reasonable model uh, for how a funder might be able to influence outcomes. Uh, you know, if your prospects of getting uh, some grants from uh, whatever the funding agencies improves drastically because you have more women and more scheduled cast, more scheduled time faculty in your programs, uh, then I think that many institutions would pay attention to not falling behind. I'm not sure that they would go the extra mile to get more people, but at least they would make sure that they uh, they have more, uh, you know, especially on the matter of gender, I think it's easy. Caste is a more complicated matter in our country and uh, I'm, I'm not personally not very clear as to how we can do it. Uh, in, you know, here there have been punitive measures that if you don't do it, you will not get X, Y, and Z, but I'm not sure that that's the best encouragement always. And great, maybe Mamo, and then after that, I'll do a quick round robin for final thoughts, but maybe in your context, we talked a bit about the US context of the National Institute of Health. Give us a little sense of what's happening in, in, in South Africa and the roles funders have or can play in accelerating these issues. You know, the, uh, in South Africa, the, the, the agenda for transformation is 
um, is huge in business, in funding, in universities. So, so there are many donors who, who certainly, if it's government donors, they will foreground transformation, either to indicate how your project is going, is going to contribute to transformation, uh, or they would prioritize people who come from um, previously disadvantaged groups in terms of getting grants. And I think, I think this can have pros and cons. My, my view is that uh, it, it's important that, that donors, funders across the board, uh, prioritize both, both excellence and transformation, uh, but, but with the understanding that excellence doesn't happen on its own. So prioritize projects that create opportunities or that enable excellence. And, and then you can see you can see more people um, excellence showing up in its diversity and support it in that way. Uh, rather than, I mean, I would hate a situation where you get a grant simply because you're black. My view is that you've got to bring something onto the table. But the issue is how do you get more people uh, uh, from previously marginalized groups to do that? You, you start with this prioritizing, understanding that excellence doesn't happen on its own. It's not innocent, it's not, it's not benign. So how do you make it happen? Uh, it's by foregrounding um, a, a transformation in particular ways that with time, the people that you've been enabling excellence on uh, then uh, uh, come up to lead uh, projects because you you don't just want them to be beneficiaries you want them to lead projects and you want to develop leadership uh, that thinks in this particular way too great so we got under three minutes and maybe i'll give each of you about you know 30 seconds of closing remarks the one things you want the people here to take away from this talk and you know how we move forward together and i'll i'll, I'll do uh mike rom dr Robowski, and then mom if we can do that you can have the last word so mike <laughs> Sure. So I think that um, from, a, from an administrative point of view, partnerships is the way to be thinking. Identifying faculty that want to be partners in these efforts within an institution. If you're a leader in a government funding agency, find programs that you funded that have been successful and require that they partner with other institutions. If they, if they want another five years of funding, ask them to identify an institution that wants to replicate their outcomes. I think people working together is the, the best approach. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we have to be a little, uh, we've got to strive for some honesty uh, in this relationship between merit and, uh, and what needs to be done. Uh, because arguments that are you know, based on some mythical standards of merit, et cetera, can always be used to exclude uh, different groups. So I think we need to, to approach this with a sense, with a sense of justice, as I pointed out, uh, and a sense of honesty. Uh, that merit doesn't come easy, uh, and uh, it's also a very subjective uh, notion. And uh, you know, disadvantaged groups are disadvantaged because they just don't have so many access to these metrics. Dr. Rubowski? We must bring the same sense of urgency to the question of underrepresentation that we have brought to this COVID crisis. And we still have a way to go with COVID, we know that. But it seems to me that means we're using the science, not just anecdotal information, to inform the way we do things. It does mean looking at best practices and replicating, and as Mike said, building partnerships. And it has to be multi-level at the national level, at the university level, what we do with the schools, all of those. And so I would say most important, let's see this as a major worldwide priority about developing humankind. And Dr. Packing. Um, my final thoughts are we've got to get out of the comfort zone. I mean, I, I, I want to, I'm adding on to um, Freeman's idea of the sense of agency. And to have that sense of agency, we've got to push ourselves into the discomfort zone. And the discomfort zone is scary. Nobody wants it. Many people don't go into the discomfort zone easily. And what COVID did, COVID kicked us out of the comfort zone. COVID disrupted the usual. And we were forced to do the unusual. The unusual that we can do, that we could never try doing because things were comfortable. So in a way, even this change, we shouldn't wait for another George Floyd situation. Because that's the alarm zone. We should push ourselves into the discomfort zone 
do that is uncomfortable, the challenging, the scary. And that means if you are the privileged, you've got to be comfortable with the idea of a distribution of privilege, that you will lose some privilege. And that that is okay, not only for the people who are now sharing your privilege, but it's okay for, the, for peace in the world. I think if we don't take, take this as a matter of urgency, we can forget about being comfortable in the world because every time we get un we get comfortable, we'll be thrown into into um, an alarm zone, whether with a George Floyd situation or some protest or whatever. So discomfort zone is where we should take ourselves. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you all for an um, amazing panel. Um, the last thought I'll have is, you know. Uh, been asked to write or think about this recently, I'd say individuals, institutions, you know, listen, <laughs> listen to people, listen to who you have there. Don't just, you know, fly in you all to talk about it, but listen to the people you have there, acknowledge where you are, how you got there, and then act because, you know, goodwill doesn't make change, but resource allocation and policy change do. And what do folks from underrepresented both backgrounds need? They need what everybody needs, opportunity, resources, and respect. And when we have that, we can all move forward together, right? Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you all for having me and having all of us to share in this important topic. I'll turn it over to Janine Stevens from HHMI, who has I guess, a few concluding remarks. Hey, everyone. I'm Janine Stevens, one of the organizers of the series. On behalf of Janelia and all of the participating institutes, I want to say a big thank you to Kenny and to all of our speakers today. The talks were amazing. The discussion was inspiring um, on this very important and timely topic. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, you know, we hope you will consider, uh, continue to join us um, monthly on the first Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, please also take a minute to complete the brief survey that I've dropped into the chat box and let us know how you felt about um, the event today. Um, and importantly, join us um, for our next Life Science Across the Globe event on June 2nd at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, the topic is non-coding RNAs and epigenetics, and this one will be hosted by the Center for Life Sciences in Beijing, China. It should be a really exciting event, so please come back and join us then. And I will also point out that recordings of today's event and all future events will be available um, within a day or two at lifescienceacrosstheglobe.org. So check it out. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>